We hope you'll be blessed and inspired and challenged and motivated by this fresh word from Christian Heritage Church. Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 13, the scripture says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some said, John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But he said, Who do you say that I am? And that's the question he's asking every person in this room this morning. Who do you say that Jesus Christ really is? Simon Peter answered and said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, and it's the rock of his confession, not the rock of Peter, the rock of his confession, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Father, now, add your anointing to the preaching of your word. Open our hearts and open our minds to receive. Let your word be life and spirit to us today. I pray that transformation occur in this room this morning. Men, women, boys, and girls come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Believers be strengthened and established in their faith. Have your way in the entirety of this service this morning. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. You may be seated. We've been talking over the last few weeks about the church, what it really is. And we understand from the original language, the word that's interpreted church or translated church in our King James, New King James, English Bibles, really is not church, but it's ecclesia. And that really means those who are called out, those who are separated for a purpose. You and I, who have been born again through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, are a part of that ecclesia. We have been called out. We've been set aside for a purpose and for a reason. And that purpose is to honor and glorify God and to point men towards the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. We lose our relevance in society. We lose our relevance in culture when we fail to remember who we are and why we're here. When we begin to think the church is really brick and mortar, it's all about steeples and bells or pipe organs and robes. It's all about our liturgy or our form of service. That's not the church, folks. That's the drapings we have placed upon the ecclesia and redefined it to fit our wants and our needs. You and I are the church. We are the ecclesia. We are the people who have been called out of darkness into the marvelous light of His Son, Jesus Christ. We're the people who have been transformed by the sacrifice, by the grace, and by the mercy of our risen Lord and our risen Savior. You know, when you look at the ministry of Jesus Christ, Jesus didn't mind saying things the way they really were. He didn't mind telling the Pharisees, you're a bunch of hypocrites, whitewashed walls, snakes, and vipers. He would confront them regularly because of who they thought they were and where they really should have been in God. And he didn't mind telling them, hey, you say, the law says, if you commit adultery, uh, you've, you've wronged someone grievously. But I say, if you lust after a woman, you've committed adultery. He said, you say you shall not commit murder. But I say, if you are angry at your brother, you have committed murder. Jesus took it from a law written on a wall or in a book to a behavior written in our hearts. You see, and that's the mark of the church. We emulate Jesus Christ. We look like him. It's interesting to me that in John chapter 8, when the Pharisees brought a woman to Jesus who was literally caught in the act of adultery, and they said, the law of Moses says, stone her, what do you say? That was really a trap. You realize that, right? The Romans didn't allow the Jews to do executions. So if Jesus said, yes, the law says that, stone her, they would turn him into the Romans for being a lawbreaker. If he refused to acknowledge the law of Moses, then they trapped him by saying he doesn't obey the law. But what did Jesus do? You know the story. It's John chapter 8. He bent down in the sand. He'd been riding in the dirt. We don't know what he wrote. But after a period of time, he looked at those individuals, those men, and said, He who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And the Bible says from the oldest to the youngest, they departed until there's no one there. 
And then he said to the woman who was caught in the very act, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Listen, he's telling you the heart of the gospel, what the church looks like in that one last statement. You're not being condemned. I'm forgiving you. Now go and sin no more. You see, the heart of the gospel is transformation. It's about you and I being different on the inside. And that affects our outward behavior. It's not rules and regulations. It's not liturgy and sermons. It's not bricks and mortar. It's not steeples and bells. It's about you and I being transformed day by day into the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ. It's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. We lose relevance when we fail to recognize the ecclesia has underwent a heart transplant. The ecclesia is different from the inside out. So many times we try to look like the world, act like the world, sound like the world, when don't you understand we have been set apart. We've been called out of that darkness into the light of Jesus Christ so that we could mirror our Heavenly Father. Matter of fact, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 tells us to be imitators of God. Verse 2 says, walk in love. How are we to be set apart? What are the differences we should show? Number one, we should reflect Jesus Christ through our lives. Secondly, we should walk in love, not only towards each other, but to everybody we come in contact with. Sometimes we, allowed our, we allow our speech, our service orders, we allow the things that we do, and we have done them for years within the church and become so familiar, it becomes not only a routine, but a rut. And when that happens, we lose complete relevance with the world, with those that we are actually called to reach and take the name of Jesus to. I want to show you a video right now that talks a little bit about how we as the church lose relevance and how sometimes our vernacular makes no sense to those who don't know Jesus. So, Wendy, if you'd go ahead and roll that video right now, that would be great. Watch this. I'm going to bring some of these terms to my friends here and see if they know if they can guess what we're talking about. What do you do if you're giving a love offering? Sex, it's sex. Sounds like an orgy. Can be what I initially think. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Open your arms to someone. The answer we've come up with is the sign of peace, either a hug or a handshake. Wrong. The answer is actually when someone comes to your church as like an evangelist or a preacher and you can't pay them, so you pass around the bucket and you give them a love offering of money. So money equals love. What is the 1040 window? Oh, that's when everybody shows up. 10-1 is going to pee, 10 is going to poop. What? And I went to Catholic school growing up, and uh, I, they used to have, like, how you called it, the coat putting on song. Or, like, it's, it's, the la- <laughs> it's the last song of church. Everyone's put on their coats. 1040 is the window before church begins, wherein you can either socialize, get a few minutes in with the reverend, priest, preacher. That is incorrect. Oh! is actually the latitude and longitude of the most unreached people groups in the world. So if somebody says they're a missionary, I'm in the 1040 window. Oh, what? That's deep. It's like some soldier right there. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> what is happening when someone is being washed in the blood? That's oh, it's horrifying. <laughs> Does the water represent the blood? blood in a baptism? Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. When you're drunk on wine. Yeah, maybe like absolved of sin. I don't know. Washed in the blood, that's totally contradictory. I mean, you can't wash something in blood. Baptism. Uh, kind of. We got kind of. Washed clean, washed in the blood, because his sacrifice he made for us, it makes us clean. If you look at someone and you're not seeing the fruit, what is happening? Whoa. Okay. They have clothes on. Oh, you can't see oh the nuts. fruit of the loins? No, fruit no. of the loins. <laughs> fruit I know loins are children. Why? Why wouldn't you see a fruit? Or maybe they, have, they don't have enough fruit? Fruit, yeah. Then they're a bad egg. Yeah. Boom. Oh. Oh. They have no God in them. Fruit of the Spirit in Galatians is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So if you claim to be a Christian and you're murdering someone, you ain't got no fruit. <laughs> <laughs> right? Is that right? I hope that helps you see a little bit how sometimes we confuse things for those around us, those we're trying to reach. Sometimes we make it so confusing, there's no way they could ever understand. 
Todd, are you here? I know you're here. I saw you earlier. Stand up right back there, Todd. Todd Gregory was telling me before service that he was at Walmart yesterday, met a young man that had moved down from Georgia, asked him, do you have a church home? The young man said, no, I don't. He said, do you want to go to church? He said, yeah, I'd like to. And then he asked him the most relevant question, have you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? And the young man said no, so he was able to lead him through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on, church, if we're going to be relevant, we've got to take off all the flowery language, we've got to set aside all the church ease and speak to people in the language they know and understand. We've got to be relevant in that sense and in that term. So this morning, very quickly, I want to share with you five things that make the church relevant in this culture, that make the church alive in this culture that make the church effective in this culture. The outline's on the back of your bulletin. You can follow along with me through these five points this morning. The first thing we need to realize is that the true church, the ecclesia, has a passion for worship. Didn't you just love when Tom led us into the presence of God this morning through that great worship service? I mean, when he started singing, say the name, I just wanted to end it right there. What more do you need? We're in the presence of the Most High God. Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, has filled this room. If you had a need in your life, at that moment, all you had to do was say the name. Say the name. His presence was very powerful to touch hearts and to touch lives. Here's the key, folks. You don't need me to tell you to say the name. Because His Spirit identifies with your spirit and gives you the liberty and a door of opportunity to step in and receive what God in that moment prepared for you. So that's why I love our worship. There are times through our worship every Sunday when we can just come to the presence of God and God comes down and God touches hearts and lives. I believe folks ought to be saved as we worship. Say amen. I believe folks ought to be healed as we worship. I believe folks ought to be delivered and set free as we exalt the name of Jesus through worship and praise. Oh, come on, church. Don't sit back there saying, I don't like this song. But enter in and say, I love my Savior. I love my Jesus. He is faithful. He is wonderful. He is merciful. He is kind. He never fails. And He won't fail me even yet today. It's time to change our perspective and recognize the true true church is a church that worships Jesus Christ. It has a passion for encountering His presence and allowing Him to transform us. You know, there's a lot of things in the contemporary church today that pass for worship that really are not. There's a lot of trappings we call worship that are really nothing more than a distraction from seeing Jesus. Now, I'm not here to condemn anyone or to call anybody out, but I'm here to tell you, if you need certain things in a sanctuary for you to worship God, something's wrong on the inside. See, worship is a personal thing between me and my God and me and my Savior. And I don't need music. I don't need instruments. You know, I can't sing anyway, so I sure don't need it. I don't need all that stuff. All I need is an invitation to enter the presence of the living God, to step into the throne room, to quit focusing on myself and my problems and turn my attention to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And when I do, a spirit of worship will well up within me and I'll say as David of old, oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is in within me, bless his holy name. That's worship, friend. That's worship. I love the music. Our musicians are here. I'm glad that we have the opportunity to hear them sing and and lead us into the presence of God. But what I'm telling you is if the power went out, it shouldn't stop our worship. If the lights went off, it shouldn't keep us from exalting Jesus Christ. We shouldn't need a keyboard or a guitar or an organ or drums. All we should need is the attitude that I'm going to exalt Jesus Christ. That's the attitude we should bring in with us every time we come. See, because true worship, remember this, remember this, true worship isn't about what I am doing or what I can do for God. True worship is about what God has already done for me. It's acknowledging what He's already accomplished in and through my life. That's true worship. Matter of fact, when we come into worship, we need to come with clean hands and a pure heart. Asking God to cleanse us, to forgive us, to purify us, to make us holy because He is holy. Isaiah chapter 6, you read the story of Isaiah's vision of the Lord. And it says he was surrounded, the throne of God was surrounded by seraphims. And the seraphims would cry, holy, 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 Lord of hosts. 
And every time they cried it, they would fall down to him. Jewish scholars tell us that that's a revelation. Every time they cried, holy, holy, it was a new revelation of the holiness of God. What am I saying to you? I'm saying worship couldn't, shouldn't be mundane. It shouldn't be routine. It shouldn't be the same old, same old, same old if we're really worshiping the living God. Because every time we come into His presence, there's a new revelation. There is a new identity. There is a new grace. There is a new mercy. There is a new power. There is a new hope released into our lives because our God is not routine. He's not mundane. He's not the same old, same old in the way he deals with us. And that should be our worship experience as well. Every time we come into his presence, we should come with clean hands and a pure heart. What does Psalm 24, 4 says? It's beginning in verse 3, let me back up a little bit. Psalm 24, 3 through 5. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol or sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of salvation. I don't know about you, but I need some blessing. I want to know that I am righteous in His sight. Well, in order to receive that, the Scripture says come with clean hands and come with a pure heart, and God will do that for us. You can read it in the New Testament from the book of 1 Peter. You'll see it in chapter 1, verses 13 and following. Peter said to those who he was writing to, rest your hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, he also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. And you need to understand, friend, holiness isn't about the way you dress. It's not about the length of your hair. It's not about whether you put makeup on your face. My goodness, if the barn needs painting, paint it. Amen. We need to understand that's not holiness. Holiness is, and my wife's going to get me for that one. Holiness is when we come into God's presence. We begin being his imitator. His reflection flows through our life. Be ye holy, he said, for I am holy. John wrote it this way in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. And I'm reading this from the message translation. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from our sins. Somebody ought to shout amen. That's a promise for you and me today. If I walk in the light, if I walk where God's calling me to walk, He is washing away. He is cleansing me from my sins. Now listen to the next verse. If we say we have no sin, everybody, anybody like that? Oh yeah, I've met a few really holy people. They're pious and they're puffed up. Don't talk to me about sin. I left that at the altar. Well, as far as I know, there's only one guy who's ever walked in shoe leather who could say he was sinless. And you're not him. Let me clarify, you're not him. So we need to understand if we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. We're deceiving ourselves. But I love verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now let me jump back to Psalm 78, verses 38 and 39. Speaking of God, it says, But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them, even though many times he turned away his anger away. For he remembered they were but flesh. You know, God knows the message says in that verse, he remembered what they're made of. God knows what we're made of. God understands that we are tempted and sometimes we fall. That's why John said, but if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My goodness, if that doesn't make you want to worship the king, nothing else will. Through Jesus, I'm holy. Through his sacrifice, I am righteous. Through his blood, I am pure. I am redeemed through Jesus Christ. That should make us shout with joy this morning. So often we, we say, well, you know, once we get saved, all that stuff leaves. Well, it should, but often it takes time to work its way out, right? That's why Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. 
And then we look back through the Old Testament, we see the life of David. David was a man after God's own heart. You realize that, right? And he was also a peeping Tom. You realize that too, right? Yeah, you can read it. He, had, he committed adultery with Bathsheba, had her husband killed. And when Nathan the prophet then came to confront him in his sin, David wrote Psalm 51. I don't have time to get into it this morning, but you need to read the entirety of that psalm this afternoon, both from the King James, New King James, and the message, and see what David is saying. He said, wash me, cleanse me, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Do you understand the connection? He's saying, when I live in my sin, I am separating myself from God, and I can't worship you in spirit and in truth if there's something between us. That's why we say, thank you, Father, that when I confess my sin, you are faithful and just to forgive me my sin and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. That's what happens when we come to Him in worship. The first thing we do is we purify our hearts because we recognize His holiness, His greatness, His purity. He is the God of all in all. And every time we come to Him in worship, you need to remember this and write it down. When we come to Him in worship with a pure heart and clean hands, He never overlooks a worshiper. He never overlooks a worshiper. God is looking for worshipers. He wants His church to be filled with worshipers. The ecclesia, first and foremost, worship Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's looking for worshipers. Number two, the ecclesia has a passion to bring in the harvest. Matthew chapter 9, verses 34 and 35, the Bible says it this way. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send out laborers into his harvest. This scripture is so relevant today, my friend. This church should be filled every time the doors are open. It's not a matter that there isn't people out there who need Jesus. It's a matter we need laborers going into the harvest field. I've told you this almost every Sunday for the last three and a half years. God didn't call you. He didn't save you to plop you down on a church seat and let you sit. He saved you. He filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to make you a witness to the world unto Him. He said, pray that God will send laborers into the harvest field. My prayer is that many of you will rise up and go into the harvest field and simply talk to somebody about Jesus Christ. I have a personal pledge. I do it every week. I I determine every week to talk to at least five people about Jesus. You know how those conversations begin? Those conversations begin with, do you have a church home, a place where you worship the Lord? And that opens the door just like it did for Todd on Saturday at Walmart to have a conversation about why I believe in Jesus and what he has done for me. Hear me, you don't need something rehearsed. You don't need to know a million scriptures. All you need to be able to do is say, let me tell you what my Savior did for me. He forgave me. He changed me. He turned my life around. If not for the grace of God, I'd be that drunkard. If not for the grace of God, I'd be that dope addict. If not for the grace of God, I'd be in prison. If not for the grace of God, what God has done for me is marvelous, exciting, wonderful, and newsworthy. Newsworthy. Your testimony is newsworthy. God, I pray now that you send laborers into your harvest field. Raise up men and women and boys and girls to thrust the sickle in and reap the harvest. Pray for our youth. They're leaving this afternoon for youth camp. I believe they're going to come back fired up and going into the field as laborers. Amen. Let's pray and let's believe God that he will bring laborers into the harvest field. Listen to me. This is God's work. You understand that, right? This is God's plan. Hang on to your seat. He's going to do it whether you choose to participate or not. He's going to reach the world whether you choose to participate or not. Why not get on God's side? Oh, I'm longing to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joys of the Lord. You know, when you hear that, you hear that when you're laboring in the harvest field. Enter into the joys of the Lord. So pray, God, break my heart for the lost. Number three, the ecclesia, the true church, is led by the Holy Spirit. 
Acts chapter 13, verses 2 and 3. You remember the story. The church at Antioch was praying, and the Holy Spirit said to them, separate Barnabas and Saul for the work to which we have called them. So they laid hands on them, prayed for them, and they sent them out. And that was the beginning of the first missionary journey. Isn't it interesting to you that when people are empowered by the Holy Spirit, what God wants them to do and what they want to do is become laborers in the harvest field. That's amazing, isn't it? So when we say, well, I'm too shy, I don't know what to say. Come on, get full of the Holy Ghost. Get the Spirit of God flowing in and through your life, and He will transform you and give you the power to be a witness unto Him. Direct us by your Holy Spirit. Should be our prayer every single day. When we came three and a half years ago, I made this statement. Carl Weir repeats it to me regularly. We're going to do one thing and one thing only, and that's follow God. Wherever he leads us, we're going to follow. Come on, folks, that's what the true church is. It's a church that's led by the Spirit. It's not programmed to death. It's a church that's led by the Spirit. Programs only complement what the Spirit of God is trying to do. I'm not against programs. This morning, Mega Sports Camp is going on back there with our children. Lives are being changed back in kid power because they're doing a Mega Sports Camp. That's all great. It's wonderful. I love it. We feed people there every Wednesday morning. Thousands of people come through and receive groceries for the whole week. Doesn't cost them a dime. I love programs as long as they are led by the Spirit of God. But when we stop being Spirit-led, we find ourselves falling into a rut. We find ourselves relying on traditions. We find these words crossing our lips, well, we've never done it that way before. We find ourselves in a position where we are drying up spiritually because we don't understand God is not stagnant, God is active. The Holy Spirit isn't sitting right back here, He's already way out ahead of you. All you're supposed to do is follow Him. Don't resist Him. Don't resist what He's wanting to do. It may be new. Matter of fact, I'll guarantee you, it's going to be new to you. But when you experience the new in God, it becomes a wonderful thing. Oh, come on. The reason people won't come to church is because it's stale, it's dry, it's routine, it's rigorous, it's hardship to sit through a service. But when the presence of God is there, when we're being led by the Spirit of the living God, a new dynamic takes place. Lives are turned, hearts are changed, individuals are transformed through the power of Jesus Christ. What did Isaiah say? 43, 18 and 19. He said it this way, remember you not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing, shall ye not know it? Rivers will spring up in the desert, and I'll make a way through the wilderness. Have you ever been in a desert place? Have you ever lived in that place spiritually where you were dry? Have you ever been on the backside of the wilderness, wondering, can I even hear from God anymore? The word is, when you follow the Spirit, He's going to do a new thing. He's going to do a new thing. Forget the old things. Remember what He's promised to do and press in and follow Him. Watch Him as He moves in your life. So pray, Lord, help me see everything in my life through the lens of Your Holy Spirit. And let me follow Him. Number four, the true church, the ecclesia, walks in vision. <clears throat> the true, true church knows <clears throat> when God gives a vision, He also brings the provision. God doesn't tell us to do something without already having the resources in place to accomplish that task. We don't have to beg for money. We don't have to beg for help when something from God is a true vision from God. It's already there. We simply give an opportunity. People tap in and step up and watch what God does as we follow Him. What does Proverbs chapter 28 verse 18 say, or 29 verse 18 say? It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Newer translations say, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. We need a vision from God. We need a vision for your lives personally. You need to know what God is wanting you to do, asking you, expecting of you. We need a vision from God corporately as this house. We need the vision from God for the entire church of Jesus Christ around the world. We need the vision because without vision, there is no revelation. There is no direction. Hebrews chapter 11.1 says it this way, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. 
Many times people will say, well, the reason I didn't follow God, didn't receive that vision, is I was afraid. And then they say, well, I know that fear is the opposite of faith. No, fear isn't the opposite of faith. That's untrue. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. That's untrue. Sight is the opposite of faith. What you see kept you from doing what God said. You need to understand we walk not by sight, but by faith. We don't rely on what we can see. We rely on what we have heard, the vision that's been downloaded into our spirit by the Son of the living God, led by the Holy Ghost. And it may not look right out here, but when we're following Him, it always turns out right. Come on, church. We need to understand we walk not by sight, but by faith. And faith enables us to tap into the vision of God. Number five. Tom, would you come back, please? The ecclesia walks in discernment. Now, I believe God gives us plans, and I believe we can formulate plans, and we can, we can make, uh, make, make decisions moving forward. But ultimately, we need discernment to know when the time is right, when the iron is hot, when we should move forward. We need discernment. If there's anything we need in the church today, it's that discernment. Paul talked about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 when he listed the spirit discerning of spirits as one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We need it desperately in the church today. There's a lot of frauds, a lot of fakes, a lot of phonies. We need to know this is of God. This is what God wants me to pursue. This is what God is calling me to do. We need discernment so we can lay our plans. But listen to me. Then we pray over them and we say, God, please direct our steps. Give us discernment. Is this the right time? Is this the right opportunity? Revelation chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Jesus spoke to the church of Philadelphia, the faithful church. And this is what he said. I know your works. I've set before you an open door no one can shut. You have a little strength. You've kept my word. You've not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. indeed will make them come and worship before your feet to know that I have loved you. Listen to this. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial. Now I want you to see it. The first thing he said is, I've set before you an open door. Well, church, we have a door of opportunity wide open before us. A door to touch and reach Tallahassee. A door to be an effective witness in North Florida and South Georgia. A door of opportunity is before us. A door to make significant difference in the heart and lives of those we love. Secondly, there's a door of power open before us. He'll make you strong in your weakest moments. Oh, don't say I can't. Say I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That's the promise of God. The true church doesn't back away because the task seems too great. The true church stands its ground and says, I can through Jesus Christ. I can do what God's called me to do. He opens a door of protection in verse 10 of Revelation 3. He said, I will keep you. Oh, you need to understand when you're doing what God has called you to do, there will be opposition. There will be persecution. There will be those who talk bad about you, but let them talk because God's already said, I'm going to keep you in that day. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to watch over you. I'm going to see you through. Oh, come on. It's time to remember greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. It's time for the church of Jesus Christ to arise and say, use me, use me in worship, use me in the harvest, use me as being led by the Holy Spirit, use me in discernment, and use me in the open doors you've set before me. Stand your feet with me across this room this morning. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Nobody's looking around. You're in this room and you say, Pastor, please pray for me this morning. If I were to die today, I wouldn't go to heaven because I've never accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want him to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I want him to change me so that I can know my eternal destiny is in heaven with Jesus Christ. That's you this morning. I just described you. Throughout the entirety of this service, the Spirit of God has been speaking to your heart, drawing you. Knocking on that door. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and let me in, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. He'll live in relationship with you. 
Our prayer is that God will take this word and plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. Father, we pray for your great wisdom to infiltrate this listener, draw them to you, and take them gently down the road to their next destination in life. And if you're in need of a home church, we invite you to join us at Christian Heritage Church on Shera Road in Tallahassee, Florida. A multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. For a worship service where the presence of God has first place, you're invited to Christian Heritage Church. Sunday morning service is at 1030, Wednesday evening at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For all the latest information, visit our website, chctoday.com.